Good evening, everyone. Uh, and you're very welcome to Arthritis Ireland's uh, Living, wi Living With Psoriatic Arthritis event. Um, my name is Gwali O'Leary and I'm Chief Executive with Arthritis Ireland. And I'm joined here this evening by Dr. Laura Durkin, who's Consultant Rheumatologist at Beaumont Hospital, Dublin, uh, and an Honorary Senior Clinical Lecturer with the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a uh, synopsis on Laura, she graduated from UCD in uh, 2006 and she completed her MD in Trinity College in uh, 2014 and was awarded an international scholarship to complete a lupus fellowship in John Hopkins University in the US and she subsequently completed her rheumatology fellowship at the University of Washington. You're very welcome, uh, Laura. Thank you for joining us Thanks, this evening. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so, um, just to, to give people a, a, an outline of what we'll be covering um, during this evening, um, we have a, I have a series of questions to, to put to you, Laura, around, obviously, on the, the whole topic of psoriatic arthritis. We've also asked um, the viewers to submit questions in advance as well, so we have a few of those questions as well that, that we, we'll um, uh, put to you as well. So I suppose, um, without, without further ado, I'll start with the first question, and it's probably the most basic. Can you tell us what is psoriatic arthritis? Okay, so psoriatic arthritis is quite a kind of a broad church of inflammatory arthritis. So the word inflammatory arthritis means, I suppose by its definition, inflammation within the joints. And psoriatic arthritis can have a number of different patterns of inflammation within the joints. So you can look, some people will have what's called DIPJ. So these, these very distal joints here in the hand can become acutely inflamed or chronically inflamed. Um, the alternative pattern is that people may present with one big swollen joint or multiple big swollen joints, or sometimes it can look absolutely indistinguishable from rheumatoid arthritis. So that would be pain and swelling across the knuckle joints. Um, in some people, the psoriatic arthritis uh, tends to be more axial. So axial means down the axis of your body. So that would be involving the spine and sacroiliac joints. And psoriatic arthritis can be a little bit of a challenge because it can be um, one or sometimes a few of those different combinations of disease um, and can be very different from patient to patient. And I suppose the other interesting and challenging thing about psoriatic arthritis is that sometimes people don't actually have psoriasis. So some of the people, their arthritis will precede their skin disease. Um, and we know that with the skin disease, so if people have bad psoriasis, so that's itchy scaly plaques, commonly on the head, the scalp, behind the ears, on the elbows, often the top of the bum, that if people have bad psoriasis, psoriasis bad enough that they need to attend a dermatologist in a hospital, that about a third of those people at some point will have psoriatic arthritis associated with their skin disease. So it's not uncommon at all. It pops up really commonly. And I suppose our challenge is to make sure that people are diagnosed promptly so that we can treat them and minimise the effect that this has on their life. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, what do, what actually causes the condition? Um, what role does genetics play? What, ro what role does the environment play? In so, things? yeah, so we're all on some level victims of our genetics, aren't we? So we all get the good genes and then we mm. get some genes that perhaps predispose us to things that we may not like as much as other things. So in psoriasis and in psoriatic arthritis, there are certain genes that make you kind of predisposed to getting the psoriasis or, and subsequently the psoriatic arthritis. And one of those genes is what's called HLA-B27. And some of the people listening will know that that was a blood test that we test for if people have back pain, to see if they may have inflammation in their back. Um, and the other genes are genes that cause kind of similar associated autoimmune diseases. So if you look at things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, lots of those autoimmune diseases have genetic predisposition. So gene little genetic changes that make you more vulnerable to getting those conditions. But those genes alone aren't usually enough for you to get the disease. So those genes need to be present in your body and then it's different ways in which your body experiences life. So even if you look at identical twins, so these are people who are born with exactly the same genes. So if you were my identical twin, you and I on the inside or and looking at a cellular and a molecular level would be identical. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we have different environmental exposures by virtue of the viruses that we get or the food that we eat or the amount of sunlight that we're exposed to or you know different things that we mm -hmm. encounter in our lives. 
And it's a combination of those environmental exposures plus your genes and, and plus a little bit of voodoo that we don't quite understand yet that leads to the development of autoimmune diseases, including psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we touched on it a little bit at the start when, we were, when you were explaining about psoriatic arthritis, but if you can maybe just outline again, like what are the key signs and symptoms um, of PSA, psoriatic arthritis? Absolutely. So I suppose the first thing that people would, would give people a, a big clue would be if they had joint pain and they knew that they had psoriasis. So if somebody has known psoriatic disease, so like I said, so scaly pack, plaques, um, tends to be elbows, nape of neck, scalp, um, if people have that, then they're in a prime position where they can kind of keep an eye out for the signs and symptoms of psoriatic arthritis. Bearing in mind that a certain proportion, I think 30% of people, maybe the skin will come after the joints. So it's not, not in everybody will they have the skin disease at the start. But if you do know you have psoriasis, then that, that puts you in a position where you can self-monitor for the symptoms of inflammatory arthritis. And what that tends to be is, regardless of the joint involved, it tends to be an inflammation so if they're small joints, you'll be able to see them. Mm. So the joint will be enlarged and it'll be warm to touch. So that goes for the hands, the knees, um, elbows, wrists. So you'd be visibly able to see a difference in the joints that are inflamed. They tend to be stiff when you wake up in the morning if you have inflammation in them. So a joint that's inflamed tends to be stiff when you've been inactive for a period of time. And the longest period of time in the day when we we're inactive for is overnight. So you lie in the bed for X number of hours. Um, and when you get up in the morning, people with a lot of inflammation in their system tend to be very stiff. It takes them a long time to get going. So that's kind of another, I suppose, clue that there might be mm. some inflammation going on. The thing about the back, I suppose, is that we don't see inflammation in the spine or in the sacroiliac joints, the same way you can see inflammation in your hands, mm. your knees, your ankles, your wrists. So in the back, we rely more upon symptoms. And the symptoms that tend to make us think that there's inflammation in the back are, so people tend to wake at night with pain in their back. That's a real red flag that people should perhaps go and get their back pain looked at if it's waking them at night. Um, people with inflammation in their back tend to be um, kind of find that they're stiff when they go to turn in the bed, which isn't a normal thing. Most people turn in the bed overnight and they don't, it's not a thing we're aware of doing. Um, and particularly that they would be stiff when they get out, in the mo out of bed in the morning and that that will ease as the day goes on. The other thing that people who have inflammation in their back tend to find is that the opposite of wear and tear back pain, people with inflammatory back pain tend to get much better with exercise. So if you make them sit down at a desk job for the whole day, they will just be miserable. Whereas if they have a job where they're up and about and they're running around the place all the day, that keeps them limber and supple. And oftentimes people who have inflammatory back pain seek out ways in which they can keep themselves limber and supple. So they'll be looking to get up on their bikes or looking to keep walking. And that keeps the pain and stiffness out of their back. Um, so I suppose the back is the one place where you mm. won't see something on the outside that would make you think that there's inflammation there, but that there are certain triggers that you should be aware of. The other things from the outside, I suppose from a psoriatic perspective that people might look at, um, in addition to the elbows, the, you know, the skin disease, would be the nail disease. So if people have very bad psoriatic nail disease, so their nails are lifting um, or they're splitting or they have the kind of big ridged nails that go along with skin psoriasis. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes those people would be a little bit more prone to getting joint disease and they should keep an extra eye out. Mm. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, now we have a few, I mentioned that we, we'd actually asked uh, people for questions in advance, so we have a few questions. I'm aware that these are not your patients, so um, okay. if they're too specific, please just let me know. Um, so one of our, um, somebody contacted us here with a question so th about fatigue. So fatigue is a big factor for me. My pain, my pain is under control. Um, my inflammatory markers are always a little elevated. Um, for example, the CRP of six, ESR in the 50s. Any tips on fatigue? Sure, yeah. So when you talk about, so I suppose you and I, um, as you know, busy people and the rest of us, everybody talks about, oh, I'm tired. And, but the truth is people who have an inflammatory condition, when they talk about fatigue, that's something completely different to when I say, I sit on the sofa in the evenings and I say, oh, I'm totally wrecked. 
that what they have is a profound heaviness and deadness that is much, much worse because they have inflammation in their system. So it, it's not that ubiquitous, oh, we're all tired kind of thing. And I suppose it's something that when people, patients come to me and complain of, I do my mm -hmm. very best to help them deal with it because it's a very disabling symptom. Mm -hmm. And it's much, much worse and a totally different thing to the kind of chronic tiredness that um, those of us who have lots of small children might complain about. Mm. So I suppose the first thing is to acknowledge that because it, it is a big problem for lots of our patients with inflammatory arthritis and some of the scientific data would say that it is something that does tend to get better when we have inflammation under control. So when people have really active inflammatory disease, you know, big swollen knees, bad, you know, bit, lots of inflammation in their back, as you can imagine, I always think of it that lots of their body's energy is going towards feeding their inflammation and perhaps the rest of them just feels horrendously drained and yeah. fatigued. And I think that's kind of something that I can understand easily. But it's also contributed to by all the other stuff that our patients with arthritis have to endure. And that's that, you know, while they have high grade inflammation, they can't exercise. So they lose all their muscle bulk and your muscle bulk is the thing that kind of um, allows your metabolism to keep going. You know, it essentially mm. feeds you, you know, um, so th and going on from that, then there's the poor sleep patterns that if you start to develop chronic pain. So if you're in a situation where you have six months where some part of your body is hurting you, you will get into a cycle of poor sleep and your brain will get into a chronic wakefulness cycle you know, similar to what we see in patients with fibromyalgia. And that also contributes to that horrible fatigue that patients have. So I suppose in terms of a management strategy for the, both the doctor and the patient, um, the first step in the fatigue management strategy has to be, you know, making sure that the inflammation in that person's system is under control. So that's, you know, that's something that should be worked on with a rheumatologist. And that's something in nowadays we should be really able to achieve. Mm. Um, I suppose the second thing is for the patient themselves to kind of have a look at what they may have lost while they've been unwell, be it muscle bulk or perhaps fitness. And those, and I, I totally, I'm saying this, acknowledging that it's really difficult to regain your muscle bulk and it's really difficult to regain your fitness. But the, I suppose the concept that exercise and building muscle might make you tired is actually totally the opposite. Yeah. So if you can break the back of it by starting an exercise and strengthening program, although the first couple of times you do it will be really tough. Once the habit starts forming and once you start to build some muscle, that fatigue becomes much, much better. And the, I suppose the added benefit to that is that once people are starting to get on an exercise program, you then get the added benefit that the sleep um, piece that people with chronic pain or who've had chronic arthritis have also starts to improve. So although it's really difficult to get that in place, that strength and conditioning piece for the fatigue is absolutely crucial. I suppose the last piece of it is making sure that if you have one autoimmune disease, you know, you are very prone to picking up another, just to make sure that someone has checked your thyroid function, that you're not deficient in iron, that there isn't some easy fix that you can take yeah. um, that would perhaps, you know, make all of this easy fa or better faster. Okay, thank you. Very comprehensive. Thank you for that. I have another one. Um, this is from another person. So I have psoriatic arthritis for the past number of years. For the last year, I have a lot of heel pain. Is this a symptom of psoriatic arthritis? Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously normal, normal, so I don't use the word normal, everybody can get heel pain. So there's mm. lots and lots of reasons why you can get pain either at the base of the heel going through the sole of the foot, so similar to say plantar fasciitis, or um, insertional pain at the where the Achilles inserts into your, into your heel. Um, patients with psoriatic arthritis get a lot of tendon inflammation. So Achilles tendonitis or enthesitis, which is the word we use to describe inflammation at the point where the tendon inserts into the bone, is really common in, in psoriatic arthritis. We do know that it tends to get better when people are on therapy, but that often tendon problems can be totally multifactorial. So it can be that there's some inflammation in the tendon, so that should be dealt with with you know, appropriate therapy. Um, but also that the tendon is being loaded in some unusual way. So that maybe with chronic inflammation or pain that you've started to walk in a funny way or that the arches have fallen mm -hmm. on the foot or that you've developed a plantar fasciitis with that. And the therapies for that are kind of, they're, they're pretty unexciting, but they do work in the long term. It's things like, you know, orthotics and strengthening programs. And oftentimes it can be doing stretches to pull out those Achilles to get a little bit more flexibility within them because lots of Achilles tendon problems 
problems relate to tightness in the back of the calf. Okay. Um, I suppose the last thing that we sometimes do is we do sometimes inject the tendons um, with a little bit of steroid to see if that helps but the issue with injecting tendons is that what we don't want to do is cause further damage to a tendon that's been inflamed mm -hmm. so we tend to reserve that and go with alternative methods if we can at all. Okay. Um, Am I talking too much, Brian? No, not at all, <laughs> not at all. No, really comprehensive answer, really helpful for, for the people who've asked these questions. Um, we had another one, I think you've answered a couple of ones we had here just in relation to tendon issues, so I'll move on to another one. This is from a person who's having issues with their neck and shoulder uh, and pain and stiffness in their neck and shoulder. And recently they've had jaw pain and pain around the eye socket. Could that be caused by psoriatic arthritis? So I suppose I, I have a couple of extra questions that I would love to know if this was one of my patients. The first question would be what age this person is, you know, because obviously mechanical neck, shoulder pain and stiffness can happen at any age. Mm. It can be, it can be from inflammation in the spine, which would relate to their psoriatic arthritis, that perhaps they've become restricted in their spinal movements in their cervical spine. Mm. And if that was a result of active inflammation rather than damage, then that would be something that would be treated with one of our therapies. If it's a matter that it's just damage then perhaps we look at physiotherapy and strengthening of the muscles to look what we to look at what we can do to build up the support but if it's active inflammation you look to treat it i'm also curious about whether there when you look at them whether or not there's anything going on with their temporomandibular joints it would be astonishingly unusual in psoriatic arthritis to get what's called tmj involvement yeah. but it would i would be thinking at that person that perhaps it would be worth getting a dental assessment just to look at their bite and to see whether or not their temporomandibular joints are giving them any trouble the last thing that we think of in every patient who has autoimmune rheumatic disease is always to make sure that they don't have anything like what's called giant cell arthritis, so mm. inflammation in their temporal arteries. It doesn't tend to happen in people under the age of 65, only in really rare circumstances. So if this person is over 65 and this is a bothersome symptom, it is always worth getting what's called an, an ESO or, or a, a SED rate, mm. just to make sure that there's nothing going for some high grade inflammation in their system. Um, yeah, that's, okay. that's kind of where that will be at in my practice. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've talked about what psoriatic arthritis is and, and the signs and symptoms. So the next question is, how is it diagnosed? So I suppose, you know, like with everything, about 80% of the story is from the patient um, and about 20% of the story is from the x-ray. Mm. And then everything you see in front of you, I suppose, is a bonus. So um, it depends really on, what's, uh, uh, on what's, how somebody presents. Lots of people come to me from dermatology clinic who have quite low grade symptoms. So they come to me because they have been attending dermatology for a long time and they have back pain or they have a knee or mm. they have hand issues. And they come to me often with indolent symptoms that have happened for a long time and they walk into my clinic. I had one of them on Wednesday and they put their hands in front of me and I go, oh, well, you've got psoriatic arthritis. And, and you know, there's no diagnostic dilemma. Mm. It is what it is. Um, and those people often have had kind of grumbling symptoms. Now, we get them on therapy. They do very well. Um, other people have a much more kind of dramatic presentation. So they're the people who I'd be called to see in the emergency department with a big, huge knee. Mm. And they'd say, you know, they'd have seen orthopedics. They'd have had somebody take the fluid off their knee. Everyone would have been worried about infection. This would be a big, hot, acutely inflamed joint. And oftentimes infection is the first thing we think about. But sometimes, you know, there's other little clues like their nails or their skin where we say, you know what, I don't, there's no infection in this fluid. This is inflammatory fluid. This is psoriatic arthritis. And then other times it's the spinal stuff. And often people with the inflammatory back pain, so the nocturnal awakening, the, stiffne the stiffness, that tends to come on quite slowly. And oftentimes people can have that for a long time before they come to attention. You know, they tend to be kind of trundling on with it. Um, but again, they will, if they have the skin disease, they'll probably be touching base with their GP. They may be seeing a dermatologist. And I suppose we would ask that they just be vigilant that if they get those symptoms, that they just get checked out. Mm. Okay. Um, are there, you know, are there definitive markers? So again, this is from, a, from one of our, our viewers tonight. Are there definitive markers that accurately identify psoriatic versus other types of arthritis such as RA? <laughs> and is it possible to misdi you know, to get a misdiagnosis of RA when instead it, it is actually psoriatic? Yeah, so, so I suppose there's some specialties in this world where people exist in the black and the white. So, you know, if you're an oncology doctor, you're, it's cancer, it's not cancer. There's lots of binaries where they exist with an, an absolute degree of certainty. Mm. 
in rheumatology, we tend to have lots of grey. And there's lots of Venn diagrams and lots of overlap between our conditions. And we have lots of fluid situations where, with time, a diagnosis where once looked like one thing kind of evolves into looking like another. And, and so, although it can be difficult for patients to think, God, they don't know what they're talking about, but actually sometimes with time, the clinical picture starts to fit something totally different. Mm. So sometimes, Gronje, we will say inflammatory arthritis as our first diagnosis. So we'll say, there's definitely inflammation within your joint. Let's go ahead and treat your inflammatory arthritis. And the handy thing is that in maybe 80% of cases, psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are treated exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So we go, we go with the best fit diagnosis. So we say you have psoriasis, uh, this looks like psoriatic arthritis, we'll call this psoriatic arthritis, we'll treat it accordingly. And then sometimes, three years later, somebody gets a really strongly positive rheumatoid arthritis blood test in the midst of all of this and starts to look much more like rheumatoid. And so our algorithm for management and our kind of labeling will ev evolves with the patient. Mm. And sometimes the patients can find it a little bit difficult to think, oh, first they call me psoriatic and now they're calling me rheumatoid and, or now they're calling me inflammatory arthritis. And the truth is that as rheumatologists, we're totally happy and content with kind of evolving clinical pictures. But for patients that can be a little bit difficult to kind of think that perhaps they were misdiagnosed, but mm. it's, it's more that our, all of our diagnoses massively overlap with each other. And, and oftentimes it takes a little bit of time before the definitive picture becomes apparent. And I have lots of patients who, who equally have multiple diagnoses. You know, I, I have lots of patients who have, say, psoriatic arthritis, but they also have gout or they also have, you know, and we look after our patients for many years. Mm. And, and it does sometimes kind of roll that their label can evolve a little bit as their clinical picture does. And it doesn't mean that previously they were mismanaged. The managements tend to be the same for the most part. Is it possible to have two, like could it you is, have rheumatoid yeah. and psoriatic arthritis or is it more that the, yeah. the diagnosis sort of evolves? Yeah, it's more that the diagnosis yeah. evolves. So it, like it would be, astoni it would be astonishingly rare to be d definitively diagnosed with both. We'd always pick the best fit really mm. for the inflammatory arthritis. There are, um, uh, somebody told me once, oh, when I was in, um, UW in, in Seattle, there was a, a tribe of Native Americans who had really, really strong genetic rheumatoid, where like masses of them all had got rheumatoid arthritis. And there was a second tribe, which was quite nearby, where masses of them all had ankylosing spondylitis, so which is similar to psoriatic yeah, arthritis. Yeah. And we had one patient where her father was from the Angspond tri uh, tribe, and her mother was from the rheumatoid arthritis mm. tribe. And she actually had definitive ankylosing spondylitis in her back and erosive rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but I think that those are That's particularly rare. niche <laughs> genetic yeah. groups. Yeah. Um, and that she was a very interesting patient. But for most people, we get the best fit diagnosis, sure. and it, but it does sometimes evolve. Okay, great, thank you. Um, just to ask you a little bit, why is it important um, to see your GP or your healthcare professional if you're concerned about about your health or symptoms of, of inflammatory arthritis? Oh, I suppose it's important because we do a great job of making people better. So people sometimes think that, you know, the, their only options will be surgical joint replacement. They're like, oh God, I don't want someone to cut a big chunk out of me and put it in the bin. Or, you know, or that, you know, or that we can't help. But the truth is for inflammatory arthritis, we do a phenomenal job of making our patients better and lead normal, um, productive, fulfilling, fabulous lives. And what we want to be able to do is to get them at the stage where they have no damage and where we can look at them in clinic and say, you know, I'd be at least 90% sure that I can completely fix you with these medications that I have to offer you. Now, you know, we may need to try a couple of different combinations or cocktails and, you know, the f we won't always get it right the first time, but we, we will help you and this will all be fine. Now, the truth is, if things go many years and, and we haven't intervened, then things probably won't go well. And, it, uh, and, mm. and we're really sad when we see late presentations of inflammatory joint disease, because if we got in there early, we'd have really been able to help. So I suppose for a rheumatologist, what we, our ultimate aim and objective is that our patients have a normal life. Um, so I want my patients to be, you know, like having a job and having a family and having, you know, going out and playing sport and dancing and doing normal yeah. stuff. But I want to get them early so that they, so that I can be sure that that's, the, that's where they continue to 
operate. Yeah. And is that job harder as people as people are later um, later being diagnosed? I think I suppose you know COVID raises the question about late diagnosis, and and do you know what, Gronya? The thing for us with late diagnosis is not really COVID. The thing for us with late diagnosis, and I'm being totally frank here, is the waiting lists in Ireland. So the biggest challenge that COVID has perhaps created an extra little, you know, problem in the system. But but the system was by no means perfect before COVID. Mm. Like there are places in Ireland where people will wait two years to see a rheumatologist, sometimes longer than that. And you know our numbers in rheumatology are at about half what they should be. Um, and what we want is early intervention. But to have early intervention. The patient needs to be able to get to us and for that to happen there needs to be you know adequate services put in place for people not to languish for two years on a waiting list so i suppose for me the early intervention yes i want the patients to go to their gps and and get referred into me or my colleagues in rheumatology in any of the room centers but we also would love to operate in a world where they then didn't languish on a waiting list you know that's mm, the, sure. that that is what we really need yeah. okay um, so when people are diagnosed, um, when they get that diagnosis, what what does the treatment look like? So oftentimes, um, so I'm going to, I suppose, I'm going to think about a patient I saw earlier this week and the conversations that mm -hmm. I had with him. So, um, you know, he long-standing psoriatic skin disease, um, new diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Um, and I suppose the first therapy that I discussed with him was methotrexate. So, um, and methotrexate is a real old fashioned kind mm. of medication. So it's, it's a medication that stops kind of rapid cell turnover um, and kind of dampens down the inflammation within the synovium, which is the lining of the joints. So the benefit in psoriatic arthritis is that you get a two for one. So you get the joint stuff, but it's also really great for skin manifestations for the most part. Um, it's a once a week medication and um, the limitations from a patient perspective, we tend to get them to really minimise their alcohol intake um, and we will be closely monitoring their liver function tests and their blood counts. About 70% of cases, that's all I need to do, Gronia. I mm. put them on it, they get better, they come back to me and say that was great. In the ones where I need to do some tweaking, there's lots of things that can happen. I suppose the first is perhaps that first therapy doesn't work. Um, the second thing that can happen is that it doesn't suit the patient, that they find that they're a bit pukey mm -hmm. or that it sends their liver function funny or it sends their blood test funny. And in that case, we then also need to go back to the drawing board. And I suppose the third scenario, and they're not a group I kind of have focused on too much now, but the methotrexate doesn't particularly work for spinal disease. So if people have inflammation within their spine, yeah. then we need to more quickly escalate to what are called biologic therapies, which for the most part, which are, are injections. So it, it is a kind of a stepwise management strategy. We start step one, we see how it goes. The ideal is that you see, see somebody every kind of eight weeks while they're starting off their therapy and you see how things are going and you know, right, well, that doesn't suit you or it's not working. Mm. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's get something different. And you kind of expect that with that two way relationship, you just get everything under control. Sometimes at the beginning, we'll do things like inject a joint. So a nice big swollen knee, giving somebody a load of pain. It's a really satisfying thing for the patient and for the consultant alike to drain it and inject it. Sometimes that gives people great relief. And often in the background, then we add in the rheumatoid therapy, which then kind of slowly builds in the background. It buys us a little bit of time while we're getting them started on therapy. Sometimes we give them some oral steroid pills and that again gives us kind of some immediate relief while the therapy is being figured out, the longer term therapy yeah. is being figured out in the background. Um, the expectation from a patient perspective when they get a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis would be for the most part they will be put on some form of therapy for it. Um, they can expect to be on that therapy or some form of therapy for the foreseeable future. Now it's not forever and everything if it doesn't work or it's not suiting we change we just have to be flexible but they can certainly expect to be seeing a rheumatologist for the foreseeable future um, and I suppose for the patient it can be quite a kind of a big thing to take if they thought they had a strained ligament or whatever so yeah. they usually will see the nurse they'll get some blood tests done and um, they'll get a few leaflets and booklets to take home with them and often a couple of x-rays you know that kind of there'll be a busy yeah. day that first day and then we'd expect to get them started on therapy and we see how it goes and most of the time with a few little I suppose changes here and there we get to the cocktail that works for the patient thankfully.
Yeah, okay. So again, we have some questions um, from, from viewers as well. Um, have there been any new pain management options made available, such as tar targeted therapeutics that you could recommend as an alternative to knee surgery? It's a tough one really, isn't mm -hmm. it? So I suppose, you know, the, the kind of holy grail for pain relief, isn't it, is that you could do something locally without having to take in medication that have massive side effects. You mm -hmm. know. We, we look at opiates, so you know morphine related painkillers, and they come with such a huge side effect profile and such a massive problem with addiction that that we have come to a point now where we know that they don't do patients any good, and that's on except in the short term, but in the longer term they're a terrible weight for a patient to take on. Now, in some cases, we have no choice. Mm. You know, elderly people with terrible joint disease who have to live with their disability, we need to get the right dose so that they can be functional. But I could understand this person's perspective that they don't perhaps want to take on those medications on board because they want to be bright mm. um, and they don't want to be constipated and they don't want to look at side effects. There aren't really that many targeted agents. And I'm, I'm one of those people, like I'm a, I, I'm, I tend to be very pro-intervention. If there's somebody in this person's life who has said to them that a surgical approach would likely be helpful, I tend to be, um, I tend to cheerlead for them to go for it and to embrace it, unless there's a medical reason why they can't. Yeah. But if somebody says, if an anaesthetist said it's safe for you, to, say, it's safe for you to have an operation, and a surgeon says they think it'll benefit you, I tend to recommend that they kind of think long and hard about going for it because you don't get a second chance at this world and in my experience what happens is that people have a window where perhaps they could intervene and then they pass the window and they get medical comorbidities and they come back to me and they're too old for surgery and yeah. they haven't you know so, so I suppose this person who's kind of it sounds like they're trying to avoid an operative intervention I would kind of say to them perhaps look again at what you're being offered from an operative perspective there are no pain relief agents that you can take. We have the topical lidocaine plasters. To be honest, I don't know that they were that great, but they're no longer, they're no sure, longer re yeah. reimbursed on the GMS. So mm. we've that, that's gone. Um, topical capacin and those kind of things. I mean, they help a little bit, but they don't tend to be a long-term strategy. Um, and then things like local injections, so cortisone injections um, do tend to be helpful. And if they haven't explored that, that might be something that could be helpful to that person. Okay, thank you. Thanks again. Um, one of the things we hear a lot about, and, and certainly a lot of people contact us about, is in relation to flares, yeah. you know, so people experiencing a flare, and sometimes people don't even know maybe what exactly a flare is. So yeah. can you explain what does maybe a flare look like for yeah. somebody with psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis, or, uh, sorry, psoriatic arthritis um, and how would you know if you were experiencing one? Yeah, so, so because it's such a mixed bag of kind of different joints that can be involved, I suppose each person's psoriatic arthritis probably looks a little bit different to the next person's psoriatic arthritis. But if you consider somebody's kind of disease course, so they come in and they're sick or unwell or they have inflammation and they get started on therapy and things start to settle down. And you, things go back to normal, we hope, and they kind of take their medication and in some ways move on with their lives and forget they even had a problem. And what can often happen then is that something unknown that we don't understand or figure out kind of triggers it to set it off again. Sometimes it's a change in medication, sometimes viral illness, sometimes totally mysterious. And they start to get an increase in their symptoms again. If, I suppose, you look first to the outside of your body, so, so the stuff that's visible, so the, the, you know, if you have visible pain and swelling or new swelling, that would be something for me that would say, oh, maybe I'm flaring in my hand, my knee, my ankle, wherever is visibly swollen. If you're feeling terrible and you're stiff and sore and you feel that your back is flaring, that would be something that you'd wake up in the morning with a very stiff sore back or perhaps you were being woke, woken in the middle of the night with a stiff sore back. Your blood tests tend to show an increase in the inflammatory markers. So that's your ESR and your CRP if you're having um, a flare of your disease. And I suppose for us, we don't consider necessarily a flare to be a treatment failure. Oftentimes we can just treat the flare. So maybe a short course of cortisone or an injection into the joint, maybe a small change in the dose of therapy that they're currently on and things can go totally back to normal. So we do like to kind of be told early so that you know we can recommend an intervention to nuke yeah. that particular flare so that they can get back to normal. Okay, great. Um, 
another kind of area where we, we obviously we get lots of questions again is the role of diet and exercise and there's obviously lots of different opinions on that um, can you give me your take on what what you believe the role of yeah. you know diet yeah. and exercise so, to be in the management of the disease yeah so, so I suppose I so I, I, I almost never um, so the diet stuff, I want my patients to have a healthy, normal diet. They don't need to be gluten-free, they don't need to be high protein. I want them to have what is a normal, healthy diet that the rest of their family eats. I want them to take their kind of nutritional guidelines that apply to the general population and take those on board. So fruit and veg, you know, meat, but not a whole lot of meat, mm. and just healthy, good food. Um, so I, I'm not particularly in favor of paleo or any, people ask me all the time about diets, and I would just like them to eat what I would consider good, normal food. Um, from the perspective of body image and body shape, what I want my patients to be is strong. So I find that as a woman, you know this kind of talk about size all the time, mm. that we're kind of constantly hearing a narrative that relates to you know, your body shape or your size, and this kind of idea that we should be all kind of shrinking into non-existence. Um, so I don't really buy into that. What I want my patients to be is I want them to be strong. So I want my therapy to result in them having normal joints. And I want them to then have the biggest possible muscles on either side of mm. those normal joints. I want them to think of themselves. And you know, us women, we're really bad at talking about strength because it's never been something that anyone has ever pushed sure. us to do. You know, yeah. men are supposed to be strong. Nobody ever talks about women being strong. I want, the, I want my patients to work their upper bodies. I want them to get some muscles. Um, I want them to start working their, the front of their legs, the backs of their legs. I want them to start working their core. And what that does is that offers their skeleton the support of some strong muscles. Yeah. And I think that we don't do enough to say, I suppose, your drugs or your medication has gotten your inflammation under control. And now I want you to be as strong as you possibly can be. I want you to pick up now small dumbbells. I'm not talking about, and I want you to start doing some reps. I want you to build up some muscles. And everything in your life will be better if you're strong, and, and I know I'm, I'm talking about women too, but I, like I, women specifically, but obviously I totally apply this to the men who sure, attend my sure. practice as well. But it is about strength. And you know, the weight stuff, I want them to have a healthy diet, but the bigger your muscles are, the better your metabolism will be. And sometimes the muscle gain kind of comes before any form of weight loss. And so I don't fixate on any form of weight loss, but I do, want my patients to be strong. That's yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move, just before we finish, I'll move to uh, a very topical area, which is uh, the whole area of COVID-19. So obviously we're in an unprecedented time where we're living through the, the global pandemic, which is COVID-19. Um, you know, as we sort of cautiously return um, to, I suppose, some degree of normality, if we can call it that, you know, what precautions, sh you know, might people with psoriatic arthritis um, continue to take? Yeah, so I suppose like this is totally new um, and there's been like vast amounts of evidence and case reports or stories of patients experiences coming at us from every direction. And when this first started, we were really worried about how our immune co compromised patients would do. We really, really were worried about their vulnerability to getting overwhelming infection and, and then subsequently dying. Um, and I think that concern was shared by patients um, and by kind of national groups alike. Mm. Um, I suppose I have unfortunately had the experience where some of my patients have gotten COVID. Um, uh, I think it's probably unavoidable in Dublin hospitals. Um, and for the most part, my patients have all had, they've come out the far side of COVID. Now I'm talking totally anecdotally. Um, a couple of my patients did badly with COVID who had bad lungs. So the bad lungs are a real kind of thing where people are particularly vulnerable. If they're going into a COVID infection and they have pre-existing lung disease, they do appear to be particularly vulnerable to getting a really bad COVID pneumonia. Um, our other patients who are on immune suppression but have normal lungs, um, for the most part, they seem to do okay. Now, that's not to say I want any of my patients to get COVID. I don't want any of us to get COVID sure. at all. 
Um, what I'm saying is I want my patients masked up. I want them gelled up. I want them to be as careful as they can be. But I'm of the opinion that it's not, it's not helpful for us to lock them up indefinitely. So I want them also to be out gaining muscle and being strong and keeping their lives going. And we have to be able to find a balance between minimizing the risk. And that's kind of a population thing as well as a personal thing, isn't it? And also maintaining our position as members of society. So I am, as you say, kind of cautiously, my patients are re-emerging. Um, I'm recommending that they mask up, that they keep their hands gelled and that they rigidly adhere to social distancing and I suppose and that we follow advice and if we find that there is a lot of community transmission in any given area of the country then I'll be saying get back to the house you know be careful of yourself mm. there's lots mm. of it around we know at the moment there isn't lots of it around but there is still some of it around so that's why we have to be careful and I suppose if it does come to what everyone talks about a big second wave then we're going to have to be responsive to what that looks like yeah. and we're going to have to roll back to keep ourselves safe and that is particularly important for the patients who are on immune suppression because the infections do tend to be a little bit worse in patients who are on immune suppression so they have to mind themselves and lots of our patients are older so again they have to mind themselves lots of them have hypertension or diabetes maybe overweight all of those things put yourselves in the at-risk category and the more at-risk categories you're in I suppose the more mm. anxious you become about re-emerging into society so I think we just have to you know, slowly allow people to move forward in the knowledge that, look, if everything starts to go wrong again, we've done this once, we'll bloody well do it again. We go back, keep ourselves safe and we see what the future holds. Yeah, so that's probably brings me to another question that um, like we would still be getting quite a lot of questions in our source of Ireland about, should I be cocooning? Yeah, you know, I don't really know. Like the word cocooning, I think, has been massively overused. And I don't really know if I... I, I haven't in recent times been using it since we've been rolling slowly out of that. Mm. I want people on immunosuppression to be extra safe, yeah. but the mental health implications of locking yourself up in your house, yeah. as well as the physical implications of locking yourself up in your house indefinitely, are going to be really yeah, severe. We're talking about July, it's July now. Like this this is going on since March. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I have to say that I think people have to rationally be able to live their lives. Yeah. And so we just have to keep a really close eye as a nation on what the risk levels are looking like and on, on, on how mm. much of it there is around. Mm. Um, and I'm not locking up my patients in their house indefinitely. I just, I, I can't do it. Um, but I am asking that they are really cautious of themselves. And I think they should ask that everyone around them is also really careful of themselves. Um, I think that's, yeah. that's what we should do. Have you any particular um, advice on, you know, as we um, emerge from the restrictions and, and workplaces are beginning to open up? Yeah. Um, we've had quite a few queries again from people yeah. who are re now returning to the workplace. Um, quite a lot of queries from people who are healthcare, working in a healthcare yeah. community, yeah. Uh, healthcare setting. Um, what w what would you be saying to those people around returning to work? I'm I'm sure it's it's a it's a difficult one. To, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard, and it's also rapidly evolving. So for the duration of the, I suppose, when things were really bad, we took anybody on any form of immune suppression or who had any comorbidities off the front line. And that's exactly how it should be. So when you're in a situation where you have a really high prevalence of a disease in the community and you're likely to encounter it with the general public, then absolutely the people who are vulnerable should be kept back from the general public. No brainer. Mm. I suppose now we're looking at the fact that in certain areas of the country, it's, you know, it's been weeks since there's been a case. So, so the chances of you picking up the infection by walking around in your daily life would appear to be very, very low. Um, and I suppose each individual hospital and each occupational health department at the moment will have slightly different practices depending on, I suppose, the chance that a person could pick it up in their given department sure. or in whatever their role is, and also depending on how common the virus is in that given area. Um, so I, I'm kind of recommending what I do is I write, a, a, I suppose, a letter outlining um, the, what are the, um, the medication that the person is taking and I ask occupational health to call me if there are any issues. But it does kind of come down to the local policies within, in particular in a healthcare se setting, the local policies within that healthcare setting to kind of 
dictate people's safe return to work because it's slightly different in each work mm. area, you know. Sure. Like somebody who's, say, doing respiratory nursing or working in the bronchoscopy unit, very open to aerosols, mm -hmm. perhaps that may not be particularly suitable. Whereas maybe somebody could be doing something where they're not uh, as vulnerable to respiratory droplets and perhaps in some instances that would be a much safer one. Or there are some instances where people are put in situations where they're, you know, they're kept, they're kept away for a while from the front line. And as I suppose healthcare workers ourselves, we have to be flexible in that regard to make sure that everyone is kept as safe as they can be. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think on that, that yeah, no, that's that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think we've kind of on the on that note around COVID nineteen, <laughs> we we might finish up um, you, tonight. Um, but thank you so much no for problem. for joining us, and for sharing so much information um, with us on psoriatic arthritis. Um, I know that our at the people viewing tonight will have found it hugely beneficial. Uh, so thank you so much. No bother. Anytime. Um, so just to let people know as well that um, this uh, psoriatic arthritis awareness campaign is supported by a grant from Novartis um, and a recording will be available on the Arthritis Ireland website and on our social media channels. So please do look us up there um, to review this again and also for further information on psoriatic arthritis uh, and other aspects of living with arthritis, go to arthritisireland.ie and uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram uh, and Twitter as well. So uh, good night and thank you for joining us.